Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to um, uh, invite and, and uh, introduce uh, our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Christian Schirsch, who is um, uh, currently a professor at the University in Tübingen, Germany. Um, Dr. Schirsch has graduated uh, from MD-PhD program in Bern, Switzerland. Bern is uh, the capital of Switzerland. And uh, he has worked as a part-time uh, resident physician, part-time postdoctoral fellow for two years in Bern, uh, and then as a resident physician in pathology uh, at the University of Bern, followed by hematopathology fellowship at the Institute of Pathology, uh, University Hospital Tübingen, and uh, cytopathology fellowship at the Institute of Pathology in Bern. Um, Dr. Schurz has spent uh, three very productive years as a postdoc at the Stanford University in the laboratory of Gary Nolan, where uh, he has been uh, 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 very productive in, in, in applying a novel technology called Codex, which allows multi-parametric uh, analysis of tissue sections. And obviously he's very well prepared as a, as a pathologist to do that in, uh, in the settings of uh, tumor immunology. And his uh, probably the best known paper is the paper published in Cell in 2020 about uh, um, uh, tumor environment in colon cancer and how it predicts uh, response to immunotherapy. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, uh, to, to hear this presentation today and, and look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Bardak, for this nice introduction. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present my work here, our work. And um, today I would like to um, give you a short overview of uh, the Codex technology and what we can do with it. And, um, my work actually focuses on the tumor microenvironment and um, on how we can predict cancer immunotherapy response by highly multiplexed tumor imaging. <clears throat> we see tumor architecture uh, as a, a hierarchy and organization of intercellular relationships. And we, we try uh, using this highly multiplexed tissue imaging to get access to the tissue in novel ways uh, also mathematically, to describe the tissue better and to infer um, how we can predict immunotherapy response from the architecture and the intercellular um, spatial relationships between cells. I have a conflict of interest. Uh, I'm a scientific advisor to Enable Medicine, a company who is actually working in the space of codex and highly multiplex tissue imaging. Okay. So our, um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will first give you a short, very short introduction to the tumor microenvironment, followed by some analytical contact, uh, concepts in high dimensional tissue imaging. Then I will go into the, more specifically into the codex method and what we can do with it in FFP and fresh frozen tissue before I go to the results section where I will talk about colorectal cancer, which is the published cell paper, and then some more uh, recent results, which are uh, pre-printed in med archive and currently uh, under review. And then finally, I will go uh, into the conclusions and outlook. The tumor microenvironment is a highly complex ecosystem of consisting of tumor cells, of course, but also many, many other cell types, including uh, structural components such as fibroblasts, blood vessels, lymphatics, exocellular matrix, and the broad range of infiltrating immune cell types, including lymphocyte subsets and myeloid cells. And all these cell types communicate with each other in the TME, either by secreting soluble factors uh, at the distance, but also by direct cell-cell contact. And we, we want to get access to this this information using different technologies. Now, the tumor microenvironment uh, has some uh, very, very important implications uh, in tumor immunology and tumor biology. And we want, to, we want to access the information by different technologies. And there have been really interesting developments in recent years uh, when it comes to single cell uh, 
analysis, such as mass cytometry, for example, high parameter flow cytometry, single cell RNA sequencing. But all these technologies require a dissociation of the, of the tumor into single cells. And then uh, we lose the spatial information and we lose the architecture of, of, of the tissue. Now, we want to know more about the architecture uh, to understand how the tumor microenvironment is assembled to better describe its function. We want to correlate the, uh, the architecture and the, the cell-cell interactions with outcomes and survival to learn about uh, to, to learn about cell-cell interactions that are important and predictive uh, in cancer, and then also to learn how we can manipulate those to improve immunotherapy. And to do this, we need novel uh, technologies, and one of them is uh, highly multiplex tissue imaging, which, uh, which is very powerful to answer some of those questions at the single cell level, especially when it comes to architecture. Now, there are several technologies on the market nowadays um, that, that can do uh, imaging of tissue with 40 and more markers simultaneously. One of them is Codex. I will go into more detail about this later. And um, as far as I understand, there is also a Codex device in Bartex lab or somewhere uh, at your university. There are different other devices. Uh, one very recent one is the Maxima which is produced by Milton e. Biotech. Um, they are very famous for MAX, uh, for the magnetic cell separation. And I already have seen this device. There is a prototype here in Tübingen. And this, this device uh, is using a quite different technology. It's a, a staining and bleaching technology, and it can do up to 300 antibodies at a the, at the time, at one time. Um, there is another German company called Cell Kraftwerk. Um, they have this cytobot and they have a special, um, special tissue pr uh, preservation uh, chambers and they can also do lots of markers. But um, I have never, I've never used and seen this, this, this machine. And these are all optical technologies. And then we have, on the other hand, we have non-optical technologies that work with uh, mass spectrometry, which is one of them is MIBI multiplex ion beam imaging. This is the Nolan lab device. This was also de um, derived in the Nolan lab, this, this technology. And then the other one is Hyperion uh, imaging mass cytometry, which is basically an extension to the, to the mass cytometer uh, from fluid ion. Now, all of these technologies have in common that we can do many, many markers at once in a tissue section. They all have their pros and cons. Now, what we do with this data later on is we have to computationally process the data to make it understandable. So there are several steps that need to be followed. One of them is we have to make sure that our stainings are correct, right? As pathologists, we, we want to uh, look at the staining at each staining individually to make sure that the staining looks right. And this is uh, all of a quality control step. Now we look at our images uh, we compare them to the HNE that we have in, in, in case of codex, we have HNEs from the same tissue sections. We then, uh, as a next step, identify each single cell in the tissue, which is done by segmentation. So we have, there are several different segmentation algorithms. This is a, a whole field of research on its own. And we try to, uh, as accurately as possible, segment the cells out and quantify their markers. This is called object identification. What we also can do is we can do lateral bleed compensation, which is a mathematical um, a model to, to basically uh, reduce the, the overlap between cells and reduce the, the lateral bleed. And we also do quality control steps here. We, we look at the segmentation results and we tweak the parameters so that we have the best possible segmentation. Finally, we get a large data frame from this uh, analysis where each column is a marker and each row is a cell. And from there on, we can then do typical flow cytometry type analysis. We can do clustering, we can do um, gating, and set, et cetera, et cetera. And we can then map the clusters back onto the tissue to see whether 
those clusters make sense. We, we validate the clusters. Uh, we, we call them uh, names of cells like T cells, B cells, etc. And moreover, we can then start uh, looking into more higher order structural features of the tissue, such as cellular neighborhoods, cell niches, et cetera, et cetera. And from there on, we can then start to do biological interpretation and correlation. In the future, and there are already trends uh, towards this, is uh, um, the idea of directly skipping some of those steps using AI. For example, to go directly to the clusters from the images, there are groups that are working on this, but I think it takes another couple of years until we are there. Now I will go into more detail about the CODEX method. The CODEX method stands for co-detection by antibody indexing. It was developed in the Nolan lab. And basically we have antibodies that are covalently linked to a DNA oligonucleotide. Each antibody has a unique barcode and we make those barcodes visible using a complementary um, fluorophore labeled oligo. This is uh, the, the fluorescent oligo. Now in the tissue, it works the following way. We um, have a tissue section. We then stain this tissue with all the antibodies at once. It's uh, only six depicted here. And then in an automated uh, manner, uh, using a microfluidics device, we add the uh, detection oligos, we image the region of interest uh, using HERXT as a nuclear marker to, to align the cells in, in all the cycles. And then we strip off the uh, detection oligos and we add the next set of oligos. And this is repeated over and over and over again until at the end we have imaged all the markers in the tissue section, which is up to 75 currently. We are currently developing new uh, additional sequences to have more markers available. This is the codex workflow. So we start by designing a panel of antibodies against antigens of interest. Usually these are uh, immune markers like CD3, CD5, CD20, CD19, etc. for T and B cells and uh, myeloid cells. We then uh, validate each of them individually and also as a panel. And then we run our samples using a multi-cycle reaction in the codex instrument. And from there on, we computationally process the data. Uh, we align the images, we stack them, we create composite images for visualization, and also we do the segmentation, clustering, et cetera, as I already described. Now, uh, from, this, from this data, we, uh, we go to the, to the cell types first. So first thing to do is to identify each cluster and give, give it a name. So for example, all the cells that have this profile here with uh, expression of CD31, we, um, we look at them on the tissue, we overlay them, and we, we identify them as endothelial cells. We then have B cells and T cells, and all of them have different uh, profiles. So we, we find the cell type clusters in the tissue. The next step is then to identify the cell-cell contacts or interactions, which is done uh, computationally using the coordinates of the cells in X and Y plane. And um, we can then look uh, at distances between cells. We can calculate um, uh, each cell-cell distance and also uh, identify niches of cells and the composition of their nearest, nearest neighbors. The next higher level above the uh, local I niches, we call them I niches for index cell, is the cellular neighborhood. And the cellular neighborhood is a patch of tissue where, within which each cell has a similar surrounding. So um, we, we think, or this is, our, this is our idea, that in each cellular neighborhood, there is a local characteristic process ongoing. For example, in the tonsil or in the lymph node, we have the B-cell follicle in, uh, and in the germinal center in the B-cell follicle, and those are different cellular neighborhoods that can be identified uh, using this technology. 
And more interestingly, when it comes to uh, the, um, the borders between different neighborhoods, we can think that uh, biological processes are ongoing between those borders. For example, a signal from neighborhood A is transferred to a, to, to a signal or a, an effect in neighborhood B. For example, a growth factor is secreted in neighborhood A here in green, which is then acting on a cell type in neighborhood B, which is shown in red, and this cell will then proliferate or something like this. And moreover, we can then uh, mathematically infer signal propagation through neighborhoods uh, by uh, correlation analysis. For example, uh, a signal uh, or a correlation that occurs between neighborhood blue and neighborhood red and neighborhood green is, is in between. It. Okay, and then another more higher level, and this is still unpublished. We, we have, uh, we, this is a, a paper that is under review now at Cell Systems. Um, with Salil Bhatti and Graham Barlow. Um, uh, those are mathematically very talented uh, graduate students in the Nolan lab still. Uh, he's a mathematician. And they are trying to describe the tissue at an abstract level and trying to identify the, the rules of, of tissue assembly and spatial contexts which are existing in the tissue. So when we go from cellular neighborhoods, then one level higher to, um, to organs, we can see that uh, several of those neighborhoods exist in several contexts. So for example, um, blue is always on the outside of green and red, et cetera, et cetera. And from this, we can, uh, we can uh, determine assembly rules. So for example, if I see green, this means it is always blue and green next to each other, et cetera. Red always means blue, green, and red next to each other. Purple always means blue, green, and purple. And we call this tissue schematics. So these are mathematical rules of how tissues are assembled. Now, in, in uh, our first paper on the codex method in FFPE tissue, we basically wanted to show that uh, it is important to not only look at one level of the tissue, but to look at multiple levels simultaneously. So here, uh, as shown, this is a, this is a, a graph from, from the paper. Uh, we are basically looking at cell types, which is, uh, which is shown here, but we are also looking at cellular neighborhoods uh, as identified, uh, as I showed before, and I will also uh, repeat this again later. Now, when we looked at how these different levels of tissue organization are coupled, uh, we can then infer um, function of the tissue, uh, for example, uh, as shown in, in gene, gene modules. Like we can identify tissue modules uh, that are identified by cell type modules interacting with cell neighborhood modules to form tissue modules. I will, I will explain this in more detail later. What we can also do, Another type of analysis is we can look at cellular neighborhoods and see whether a certain cell type that expresses a certain marker, for example, PD1 expressing CD4 T cells, is enriched in a certain neighborhood and if this correlates with survival. And once more, uh, we can also look at cell neighborhood communication. For example, this is, this is now a bit complicated. I will not go into more detail about this. But basically it is uh, looking at the correlation between different cell types that are enriched in different neighborhoods and then build, a, this is called canonical correlation analysis, CCA, uh, build a communication network of correlated um, cell types. Now uh, I will uh, go briefly over the, the cell paper uh, a little bit to, to explain in more detail what we did. So we were interested in colorectal cancer and there is a long tradition of colorectal cancer research in the University of Bern, where I come from. We have large clinical cohorts there, all very well annotated with uh, tissue, microarrays, et cetera, and with clinical data. And from this cohort of about 700 patients, we identified patients who had a very peculiar 
inflammation uh, patterns in their uh, tumor invasive front. One of them is called Crohn's-like reaction, which is basically a, a very uh, organized inflammation consisting of many, many follicles, many, many tertiary lymphoid structures that are formed in the front of the inv invading tumor. On the other hand, and this is a spectrum of, of this is a spectrum of uh, inflammation types. On one end of the spectrum is the Crohn's-like reaction, and on the very other end of the spectrum is the diffuse inflammation. And those patients do not have any follicles. They only have a very chaotic diffuse inflammation and they do very poorly. And this, this cohort that we had was matched for all the other uh, factors such as age, sex, um, and the tumor type, tumor location, et cetera. And as we can see in this survival uh, curve here, the patients, I, I call them now CLR patients, Crohn's-like reaction, they did much, much better than the diffuse inflammation patients, which I call TII. So from this cohort, we constructed tissue microarrays. We drilled four uh, representative regions for each patient from the tumor invasive front. And we constructed tissue microarrays with those inflammatory enriched um, regions, 17 CLR patients, 18 DII patients. And we performed codex using a panel of 56 antibody markers as shown here. We focused on immune cells, but also functional markers <coughs> and uh, some auxiliary markers to identify tumor cells, blood cells, uh, blood vessels, um, uh, smooth muscle cells, etc. So this is a short video that shows you how the data looks like. Uh, when we, we do the codex. So on the left-hand side, you can see the follicle patient with the follicle in the center. And on the right-hand side, you, you can see the diffuse inflammation patient with uh, lots of macrophages. And uh, now it's stopped working. Let me see. Okay, someone stopped working. Now it works again. And each of those um, images you see is one cycle of the codex experiment. So uh, we can visualize the cells very well. We can see them. Uh, we can also see that there is a very good um, resolution. We have single cell resolution, of course. Each pixel is about 400 nanometers at, at 20x resolution here. We can go even higher at 40X, we have a resolution about of 180 nanometers per pixel. Uh, one of the big advantages of Codex is that we can do H and E staining, uh, which is shown here. We, we do this at the end of the, of the fluorescent uh, experiment. And um, we have a perfect uh, correlation of H and E and our fluorescent data. We then, um, uh, made some, some images to, to look at the cell types here as overlays of different, um, uh, different uh, fluorescent markers. And as you can see here on the left hand, uh, on the, on the, on the right hand side, we, we can really see nicely, for example, regulatory T cells that are expressing CD4, CD25, and FOXP3 as shown in nuclear red staining here. We then clustered the cells. We identified 28 different clusters. Um, this is now very simplified here. Uh, we only show, we're only showing nine clusters here to, to, um, to have this uh, human digestible, in a human di digestible way, because um, if we do 28 clusters in different colors, it's, it's only, you cannot really discriminate them. But we can see that the, the B cells are in the follicle here, and we can see that there are lots of macrophages and uh, other immune cells in the diffuse uh, patient. Now, this is a minimal spanning tree. This is uh, showing you uh, the clusters. And each, each node is a cluster, and the size of the node tells you how many cells we did find in those patients. So this is pooled from all the patients here uh, for the CLR patients and here for the diffuse inflammatory patients. And uh, when we looked at those um, uh, clusters, we did not really see 
big, really big differences uh, in the numbers of cells. Of course, we had significant, significantly more B cells in this group, and we had uh, slightly more granule sites, uh, statistically significant in the diffuse patients. But overall, it was not that much different. Uh, for example, if we just had done fax analysis, uh, we would not have seen that there was this striking architectural difference in the, in the, in the tumor microenvironment if we just look at numbers of cells, right? And here the coloring tells you the PD-1 expression. So we saw that there was slightly higher levels of PD-1 in the diffuse patients. So now uh, we, we went to the neighborhood analysis and this algorithm is basically designed to identify regions of the tissue within which each cell has a similar surrounding. So this works like this. Um, we have windows uh, of a certain size. We can define the size of the window. And um, the center cell and its uh, X or Y nearest neighbors are then um, analyzed for each window, uh, cell type A, B, C, et cetera. And those windows are then clustered and uh, the center cell is then assigned to a certain neighborhood. So we, we identified, uh, we said we wanted to have 10 neighborhoods and 10 cells uh, per window. And like this, we identified 10 different neighborhoods. One of them was uh, imaging artifacts, which we removed. And then we ended up with nine different neighborhoods that we identified and they are shown here. For example, uh, the green neighborhood, which is not represented in those images here is the tumor. Uh, which mainly consists of tumor cells. Then we had a, a neighborhood that consisted of tumor cells, but also immune cells. And we, and we saw uh, on the image that this was all, always um, close to the tumor. So we called this a tumor boundary. And of course the follicle here as shown in brown, mainly consisting of B cells and then some other, uh, some other neighborhoods, for example, a granule site enriched neighborhood, which was sometimes a little bit more enriched in the, um, in the diffuse patients. But overall, besides the follicle, which was significantly enriched in the CLR patients, we did not see uh, any differences in the frequencies, any significant differences in the frequencies of those neighborhoods. But what we saw was that the neighborhood, so, so the, the amount of neighborhoods was the same between patient groups, but the, the organization of the neighborhoods was quite different. As you can see here, the blue neighborhood is very well formed in this, uh, in this um, patient here. We call it the T-cell enriched zone, which is outside of the follicle. And in this patient, we have a blue neighborhood, which is similar to this one in size, but it's all, it's, it's all over the place. It's very chaotic. So uh, we then uh, wanted to describe the tissue in a, in a different way and to uh, simplify and to um, basically um, uh, do a simplification or uh, to, to bring it into a more digestible uh, and analyzable uh, form. And we, to do this, we used tensor decomposition. So this is basically a higher order uh, generalization of principal component analysis. And what we did here is for each patient group, we created a tensor. A tensor is basically a three-dimensional data frame where uh, we have the cell neighborhoods, the cell types, and each patient. We removed the follicle regions for this analysis from the data, data set because we already knew that this, uh, this region is probably heavily biasing the analysis. So we removed this uh, and we only wanted to look at the non-follicular uh, data. Now, how can we interpret this result? And this is also from the paper, from the supplementary uh, discussion. Uh, we, can, we can think of a cell, um, uh, we can think of a tissue uh, built from uh, cellular neighborhoods and each cellular neighborhood has a function. And the, to, to fulfill its function, it needs to recruit cells into it. So there are cellular neighborhood recruitment factors, which could be, for example, um, a, a chemokine, right? And then the cell types that react to this factor and localize into this neighborhood uh, express a localization factor, which could be, for example, a chemokine receptor. 
And when we look at the composition of each cell or neighborhood and each cell type across all the patient groups, we can, we can identify correlated interactions of cell neighborhoods and cell types across those patients. And when we do this and we represent this graphically using, uh, using modular um, graphical representation, we can see that cell type modules interact with the cell or neighborhood modules. So a module of cell or neighborhoods with, which uh, is interacting using this, uh, this edge here with a cell type module. And this forms uh, all these interactions together form a tissue module. And uh, our analysis, we, we did elbow uh, analysis and we identified that the optimal representation of the tissue is found when we have, when we describe it with two tissue modules. So you will, you will see it, uh, it is much clearer when we look at the actual result. So this is the result for the CLR patients. So this is what this algorithm found. And I, I will walk you through, it looks very complicated, but it's actually, uh, uh, when you do this, uh, when you look at this very carefully, it's actually not that, not that complicated. So what we first did is we identified what, what is in our tissue modules. And tissue module one, we called the immune compartment. We found that it was mainly formed by cell or neighborhood modules and cell type modules that had something to do with the immune system. And on the other hand, we had the tumor compartment, which is the tissue compartment that was basically containing tumor CNs and tumor cell types and some structural, some structural uh, like vascular, smooth muscle, et cetera. This was one of the, of the findings. And then another finding was that was very interesting to us was that um, macrophage, macrophage modules were, uh, were separate from, from the, um, from the cell, uh, T cell modules. And this, only, this, this, this analysis only makes sense when we look at the other result from the, from the diffuse patients, which I'm showing now, because in the diffuse patient, it looked completely different. In the diffuse patients, we had a, a tumor was basically inside the same module as the immune system as shown here. So we had, we called this the tumor and immune compartment. And then on the other hand, we had a separate module of tissue, which was defined by uh, the presence of granulocyte neighborhoods and granulocytes. So we call this the granulocyte compartment. This was the, this was the first interesting difference. The other difference we saw was that the macrophages were in the same module as the T cells. And uh, it is well known that macrophages are probably most often uh, immunosuppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment. And this could be a nice explanation for this. So from this result, uh, we were interested in what, what the function of this uh, granulocyte compartment could be in, in this patient group. So, from, so this, this tensor decomposition analysis basically informed our further analyses. And uh, as I showed in the in one of the first slides, uh, we were also interested in different checkpoint in uh, checkpoint molecules and functional markers uh, expressed on cell certain cell types. And uh, what we wanted to to study was different uh, important cell types such as regulatory T cells, CD8, CD4 T cells, and macrophages, and what uh, they express. And we chose those three markers: PD1, Chi67 for proliferation, and ICOS, which is an activation marker. And I'm only uh, going into one uh, cell type here, which is the CD4 PD1 T cell, which is probably an exhausted T cell, but it could also be an activated T cell because PD1 is both uh, an exhaustion and an activation marker. And when we looked at this cell, we saw that in the diffuse patient, this cell type was enriched in the granulocyte neighborhood, which is neighborhood nine here. And when we looked uh, into this more carefully, we saw that there was, a, there was a correlation between the numbers of those cells in this specific neighborhood and survival. Because patients who had a higher number of those CD4 T cells in this neighborhood, even they were in the diffuse group, which had a very poor survival, 
still had a better survival than patients who had almost no of those cells because those patients, um, they had a very, very poor survival. So this highlights that the location of certain cell types in certain specific areas in the tumor microenvironment could have uh, implications um, on, on, on survival and outcome of, of cancer. Now I will uh, move on to the next project, um, which is uh, still unpublished. It's only in a preprint in Med Archive, uh, which deals with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And um, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma is a rare skin cancer, uh, which has different stages. It usually starts as insidious patches on the skin, which uh, can also clinically mimic uh, different benign uh, conditions such as eczema or psoriasis, and it takes on average six years until a diagnosis is rendered. It, it can progress into a higher stage disease, a plaque stage, which in, in which these patches get thicker, there's more tumor cells infiltrating, and finally the tumor stage, and the tumor stage has a very, very poor outcome. And we reasoned that the composition of the tumor microenvironment and its architecture are important determinants of uh, disease progression and therapy response. So we were very fortunate to have access to a cohort of patients who were treated in the CITN10 trial with anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab. And we had uh, patient tissues before and after therapy from seven responders and seven non-responders of this, of this therapy. We created tissue microarrays to perform codex, and we also performed RNA sequencing and integrative data analysis. This is the tissue microarray here, shown in a, in a multicolor image. This, this cohort were, was already published before by Michael, our collaborator. And we see here the responders and the, the stable and progressive disease patients. And in our cohort, we had only a sufficient material from 14 patients out of 21 that um, we saw that uh, there was a significant difference in survival between the responders and the non-responders. Uh, we had a panel uh, which was uh, quite different from the one in the uh, colorectal cancer study. We had many, many more uh, T-cell markers for all the different uh, immune cells. And the problem in this, in this case was that the tumor cell actually is a T-cell itself. So we had to find a way to discriminate at the single cell level the tumor cells from the T cells. And we were able to do so by a combination of markers, uh, most importantly, CD7, which is a, a T cell marker that is often lost very early in, uh, in cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So it's not expressed in the tumor cells. On the contrary, we found that CD25, IL2 receptor alpha was upregulated. It's a survival signal. And also the proliferation marker Chi67 was much higher in the tumor cells as well as their size. We can, we can um, measure the size of the cells and we saw that the tumor cells were much bigger. So we were able to discriminate the CD4s from the tumor cells at the single cell level in this tissue. This is a, a short uh, video showing you some of the raw data in the, in the, color, um, in the CTCL study where we have responder and non-responder post-treatment just to show you the, the, the images of, uh, of the cells of the infiltrate. And again, we, we performed clustering in this, in this uh, cohort. And we identified 21 different clusters, as shown here. And uh, two of them were tumor clusters. They are all clustered together with the CD4 and the CD8 T cells. Uh, a tumor cluster in the dermis and a tumor cluster intraepithelial tumor cells. We had regulatory T cells, B cells, CDA T cells. And also uh, in the myeloid lineage, we had different subtypes of macrophages, Langerhans cells, and we had the auxiliary components such as stroma epithelium, etc. When we mapped the clusters to the tissue, we had a, a very nice correlation. Uh, with uh, the fluorescent images and also with the h &E images. This is all, again, a simplified, simplified uh, version of the clusters. 
only uh, seven clusters shown here. And when we counted the cells per, per tissue, so here is shown in this, this image is shown pre and post treatment patients, responders and non-responders in different colors. We did not really see um, significant differences between the, the cell numbers in, in these clusters. This is all non-significant. And this was actually confirming the results from the JCO study from Michael Kotedaust, who actually showed uh, using standard immunochemistry that they could not find any differences in uh, responders and non-responders to predict, uh, to predict the, the treatment response. So they were unable to do so. And we could confirm this data. We also looked into PD-1 expressing cells. We did not see big differences. The only cell types that we found uh, significant differences in were very rare subtypes of cells, such as ICOS positive CD4 T cells. As you can see, the frequencies of those cells were very, very low. We saw that those activated CD4 T cells were more frequent in the responders pre and post treatment. And that some immunosuppressive cell types were more frequent in the non-responders. But these cell types were very, very, uh, th these cells were very, very uh, low abundant. And we did not really, um, we did not really uh, trust this result very much. And we wanted to look into more architectural features. So we again performed neighborhood analysis using our algorithm. As you can see here, we have the epidermis uh, as nicely uh, correlating with um, the H and E. And in the in the infiltrate, we by the naked eye cannot really see much. This is all like small blue lymphocytes, but when we do the uh, um, analysis with the neighborhoods, we start seeing some structures here and we identify different neighborhoods such as neighborhoods enriched in tumor and dendritic cells, tumor and CD4 T cells, and also a regulatory T cell enriched neighborhood. And when we then quantified these neighborhoods now here, we saw that there were some differences, interesting differences coming up in the different patient groups, especially the one with the dendritic cells uh, and the one with the CD4 T cells. So we, we, uh, we called them immune activation neighborhoods were much higher uh, after treatment in the responders, but not in the non-responders. Uh, and on the other hand, the regulatory T cell enriched neighborhood was much higher in the, in the um, non-responders before and uh, after treatment as well. So again, um, I want to stress here that the, the regulatory T cell numbers themselves were not significantly different between those groups, only how they were spatially arranged in the tissue. Now we wanted to simplify this, this uh, this predictive uh, marker into a more simple score. And we came up with the idea of calculating the distances between those different cell types. So um, what we came up with was a spatial score where we thought we, we reasoned that um, the distances between the cell types in the tissue could have an effect on response or non-response. And our idea was that if an effector T cell is closed by a regulatory T cell, the chances that the regulatory T cell inhibits this effector cell uh, are, are high. Whereas when uh, an effector cell is closed by a tumor cell, the, the chances are that there could be some killing mechanism involved are high. So, if we, if we uh, compute the distances between those cells as distance A and distance B, and this gives us a, a, a score where we divide A by B, uh, a low value should be a good result. Now we did this for all the cells and uh, we, we found that PD-1 CD4 T cells showed as a spatial score that was much lower in the responders than in the non-responders. And this was even enhanced after treatment. This was also true for total CD4 T cells, although a little bit less pronounced, but it was not true for CD8 T cells where we did see no difference at all between the two groups. So this was already interesting. We then confirmed this data on a different platform called Vectra. Uh, 
this can do seven markers. And we uh, came up with a panel to identify those three different cell types, regulatory T cells, tumor cells, and PD1C4 T cells using those markers here. This was done in collaboration with the Fred Hutch. And we, we did this using the Vectra and HALO analysis. And we came up with a similar result in a different tissue section, of course, um, where we saw that the spatial score was much lower in responders pre and post treatment. Now, what is the mechanism behind this? Why are the CD4 PD1 T cells so important? And there was a very nice paper last year in Cell where they showed that CD4 T cells can actually be cytotoxic. So we, we, we went into our data and we looked into uh, granzyme B, which is a cytotoxic molecule. And we saw that granzyme B is expressed in a subset of our CD1, uh, CD, PD1, CD4 T cells, about 10%. And only in the responders, this, um, this percentage went up significantly, but there was no change in the non-responders. So the idea is that PD1 blocking somehow activates those PD1, CD4 T cells to express uh, cytotoxin molecules. We also performed cybersort analysis using our RNA-seq data. This is shown here, um, the RNA-seq data and the responders uh, after treatment. We found that CXCL13 is uh, upregulated. CXCL13 is a chemokine that this is, is important for recruiting CD4 T cells into the tumor microenvironment. We did cybersort um, to identify cell types out of, out of the bulk uh, RNA sequencing data. And we basically found that using the cybersort analysis that CXCL13 is mostly expressed by tumor cells in CTCL. And that in the, in the responders, there is an upregulation of uh, tumor cell derived CXCL13, whereas in the non responders, this does not happen. And using our multiplexed IHC data from the Vectra, we then, uh, on top of that, we performed a DAP immunostochemistry with CXCL13, and we could actually correlate um, and uh, co localize this with the tumor cells. So this was really nice. Um, to have this confirmation. So in the end, our hypothesis is that there is two states of, uh, of tumor microenvironment in those two different patient groups. Uh, in one, in the responders, there is uh, a tumor microenvironment that can be activated by PEMBRO uh, addition. And it, re it leads to um, uh, the uh, effector PD-1 CD4 T cell activation which are recruited to tumor cells uh, by CXCL13. In the non-responders, we have a very uh, strongly um, immunosuppressive uh, microenvironment with ICOS positive Tregs, rex which are more immun immunosuppressive. And here, PEMBRO addition does not really, uh, is not really sufficient to overcome this exhausted phenotype and this uh, results in non-response. So in summary, uh, we have uh, different, um, different uh, pillars of our research. We have technology, computation, we have uh, mathematical rules of how tissues are assembled. And finally, we can infer biolo biological mechanisms from this and we can correlate it with clinical uh, outcomes. And I think highly multiplex tissue imaging uh, enables the prediction of disease progression outcomes and response to therapy. And also uh, it facilitates the discovery of new biomarkers and also biological mechanisms that could be at play. And it is a nice tool to, um, to generate hypotheses. So um, to take home, uh, I think uh, Codex and all these, these Hyplex um, analysis uh, platforms are very, very valuable. Um, it is, it is not, not easy to perform. Uh, you need a lot of expertise. And I think uh, departments of pathology are uh, very well suited to, to perform those analyses. And um, we can do uh, validation with different platforms. We can extend our findings using, for example, RNA sequencing or proteomics. And um, I hope I could convince you that PD-1C4 T cells, which we identified in two independent studies, 
as important players um, in the tumor microenvironment, uh, I think those cells will be very, very interesting to, to study further. So I would like to thank uh, uh, all the people who are involved in those studies, especially Gary Nolan, Yuri Goldseff, Darcy Phillips, Magdalena Matusiak, and also the computational wizards, Graham Barlow and Salil Bate, uh, the founders and all the collaborators. And finally, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take your questions now. Thanks. Hi, this is Leo Ferg. Um, very exciting talk. Um, interesting on many fronts. And um, I, I wanted to get your speculation about how far you think this, we may be away from using this exciting um, technology clinically. It seems that, um, you know, it, it seems like a logical extension to go, to use this as stratifying patients. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Initial resection or biopsy or whatever. And, uh, Absolutely. I mean, that, that's so, it. I mean, with all the new immunotherapies and everything else, it, uh, it seems quite, quite exciting. Absolutely. So we're actually already um, planning some studies here in Tübingen. We have the molecular tumor boards here. We have the uh, Center for Personalized Medicine here. And we are actually, we, we actually recently submitted some grants to, um, to basically uh, take biopsies of patients who are really, really advanced cancer patients with metastatic cancer, take biopsies before and after immunotherapy to really start uh, using this technology to predict or find, find biomarkers of therapy response for those patients. Yes, so we are basically starting to implement this into the clinical, extended clinical routine. But the bottleneck, the bottleneck always is the analysis. I mean, running the samples is, is something, it's a technical thing, right? You can train the technicians to do this. This is, you, you can buy the machines. Um, the throughput is not, not that high yet. So we, we have to work with tissue microarrays and the experiments take a long time to do. On the machine, but if you have a couple of those machines, you can you can run a couple of samples per week. The problem is the analysis, and the uh, really there we have we have a bottleneck, uh, a huge bottleneck. I think. Thank you. Yeah, I I I have a few questions. I'm not sure how many of them I can I can get through, but uh, uh, thank you. That was quite uh, stimulating. I think the first question is quite basic. So were these sections frozen tissue or were they paraffin? Because they look so good. Um, this was paraffin. This was all yeah. paraffin. Yes, yeah. we can we can do both. We can we have I have panels for both fresh frozen and paraffin. Mm -hmm. um, but this was all paraffin because those were retrospective cohorts. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think that's quite uh, encouraging because one of the problems, at least that we have had, is getting uh, immunofluorescence to work very well on paraffin. And looks like uh, so. I'm I will probably get in touch with you through uh, Bache to see what your protocol is for getting such uh, you know good staining on paraffin. I think that would be helpful. My second question has to do with. Uh, the latter part of your presentation, the T-cell lymphoma. So with this analysis, were they supervised or were they unsupervised? So did you know who was responder or no responder upfront before you? Started? Yes, yes, so this was yes, it. yes. We knew that, we knew that upfront because this was a, a study that was conducted before and we had all the data, yes. Okay, all the data. Yes. And then I'll ask one more and uh, give chance to somebody else to ask the question. And this is probably more related to Leo's first question. Uh, do you see this? So one of the other, one of the current issues in personalized cancer care is uh, tumor heterogeneity. Yes. And so you take breast, for example. So we do our two at ERPR and everything. And I mean, you need 10% to be positive. And sometimes yeah, is the tumor is not going to respond. So do you see this, this is a form of a spatial study, right? Do you see this being a complement to spatial gen uh, genomics 
uh, especially in this kind of patients where you can look at different aspects of a tumor and determine the different genetics that might require a combination of therapy, uh, especially in those that failed the primary treatment. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is a very, very important point, the tumor heterogeneity. And I'm, I think we cannot really fully, um, uh, really fully uh, understand it using this, this technology. I mean, we only have small biopsies. We have, we have uh, tissue cores, which are highly selected from, from, a, from a larger tissue. So we, we can try to like, uh, to, to try to represent the heterogeneity by taking multiple cores for a tissue microarray from different regions of the tumor, but we will never, we will never be able to fully uh, comprehend the, the real heterogeneity. But I think in our case, um, we are more interested in the microenvironment itself and not the tumor cells. So we want to see whether we can find predictors of immunotherapy response that are related to, to the microenvironment and not the tumor itself. So we are, we are interested in finding the regions of the tumor where the, um, the microenvironment and the infiltration of immune cells is the highest, right? To, to see where we, uh, how this relates to, to therapy response. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Christian, this is Mike Farrar. Hi, um, hi, Mike. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, we have a common interest in cytolytic CD4 T cells since we see that happening in our leukemia models. I had two questions for you about the talk today. So you were showing these differences in the composition of cellular neighborhoods. In certain cases, they were more fragmented and others are sort of more consolidated. Yes. Look at interventions like Checkpoint. Do you see, in addition to sort of reorganization of the neighborhoods potentially, can you see changes within a neighborhood that you've identified with or without um, the checkpoint inhibitor? In other words, is the quality of the neighborhood change as well? Is that something you can pull out? Um, we, we did not really look into this in this case. So um, the, the point here is this neighborhood algorithm, we, using this neighborhood algorithm, we, um, we analyzed the data all at once. We did not do this uh, for different groups. So we, we pulled, put in all the data. So it, it basically reflects before and after treatment uh, uh, at the same time, right? We did this uh, with the colorectal study. We did, um, as a quality check, we did a separate neighborhood uh, analysis for the, uh, for the CLR and the DII patients. And we, we actually identified similar neighborhoods. Of course, they were a bit different, but on, 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 on the large scale, they were, they were very similar, but we did not, we did not do this for the CTCL, uh, for the pre and post treatment. So I, I'm, I cannot answer your question basically, but I think, um, I think there, there would be differences there as well. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm we're curious because when Sean has been looking at leukemia as with or without checkpoint, he can clearly identify distinct subsets by single cell and the intervention doesn't change the number of subsets necessarily, but changes what they look like to a certain degree. Um, the second question is in the spatial um, analysis that you were doing at the end, you were saying, yes, we can see this change in the spatial score, both pre and post treatment um, in the responders versus the non-responders. It looked like, at least on the last experiment that I saw, I don't remember the first one, is if the spatial score actually got better post treatment. Yes, is that yes, a consistent yes, feature? Yes. Yes, 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 absolutely. I can go back. So we already saw this in the first, um, uh, we already saw this here that it, it actually improves even after treatment. Yeah, correct. Okay. And this was, this, was even, this was even more enhanced in, the, in, the, um, Vector. in this data set, right? So something happens here for sure, yeah. Just curious, I think most of the, 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 the clinical diagnosis is use the, 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 the conjugating secondary antibody. Are you going to label more primary antibody with this DNA link and for the diagnosis and get maybe a FDA or European Union approvals? Um, so we are actually not using secondary antibodies. We are using oligonucleotides to detect our antibodies. But 
Um, we are we are currently working on this. Yes, so uh, I have another forty uh, different uh, oligos that I want to test uh, uh, to to create more more labels for our antibodies that we can do more. But um, the the other technology, which is called Maxima from Miltony, it can actually do three hundred antibodies that they claim. So I. I it's it's still only uh, working in fresh frozen, but I, I'm sure they're working uh, like crazy to 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 um, to make this also work in in FFP. But um, the difference here is that the machine is is much more expensive, so it's about it's like 800 900k something like this. Um, yeah, I enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, every time I, I have a new question, uh, uh, but the broad picture. Uh, impression do you think uh, this would help us in diagnostic hematopathology i know you're doing hematopathology as well and do you see application of this methodology absolutely absolutely i mean how many times are you wondering whether uh, a, a certain cell co-expresses certain markers and i mean we i i work with professor fend and his wife here they are they're very well uh, very good hematopathologists and sometimes we actually do double stainings for, for PAX-5 and, and some other markers, uh, TDT and PAX-5, for example, or such, such things. Um, no, no, not TDT, um, whatever. Uh, so we, it, it would really be helpful to, to have, uh, to, at least for tumor diagnostics in, in hematopathology, to have the co-stainings. And I think in the future, it will be much easier to analyze the data using software that are that are developed already. And, and I think we will have to. I think we'll have to rewrite some diagnostic categories too. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Uh, at least in hematopathology, I'm quite sure there is there's going to be a lot of a lot of new new uh, insights. Yes. Thank you. Christian Leo Furt again with another uh, comment, I guess. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to say this is decades old work of mine and the late Joe DeLarco, but um, I, I, uh, we were able to show that uh, the interaction of neutrophils with tumor cells that can be somewhat interleukin whatever mediated uh, led to a propensity of metastatic cells. So, you know, it may, you may be to able to interrogate tumors initially over time with enough data and samples to um, perhaps seek, seek out a population of cells within the tumor that are moving towards this kind of phenotype, a metastatic phenotype, whatever your impressive technology may show, which would be just tremendous to know. Yeah, I think the neutrophils, I think the neutrophils are, are really interesting cells and um, as we as we saw in this neutrophil uh, neutrophil compartment in the colorectal cancer, they clearly play an important role. And we we already we also discussed some of those findings uh, in our discussion. Uh, why are the CD4 PD1 CD4 T cells, uh, especially in the neutrophil compartment, so important? Right, and it could have something to do with antigen presentation because this is, I didn't show this in the presentation, but we also found that. Um, Antigen presenting cells are actually more enriched in this in this neighborhood, and I think it could be that neutrophils somehow de degrade tumor uh, components, and then the antigen presenting cells are presenting it to the to the CD4 T cells, and this leads to a to a better immune response in those patients. Yes. Thank you. So eating a barcode is proprietary, or you can give it to people for conjugating to the primary antibody? Uh, it's all published in our cell paper. Okay. Thank you. It's a nice talk. Okay, so I think we will uh, finish the presentation. Thank you very much once again uh, for a very stimulating presentation and a great discussion. Thank you.